Hello and welcome. This is the adult uh, Sunday school lessons for the First Baptist Church of Alabaster. Um, this is the Explore the Bible series. And the date uh, for this Sunday school lesson is March the 7th, 2021. Again, it's Explore the Bible. The title of the lesson is Neighbors with a question mark. Uh, as believers, we are to demonstrate our love for God uh, by extending grace to those that we encounter. We'll be looking at Luke chapter 10, uh, verses 25 through 37. I hope you have your copy of the Word of God. And uh, let's begin reading at the 25th verse. And behold, a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by a chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he uh, set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took, a, uh, took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever uh, more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said, You go and do likewise. Now consider this quote. It is no chore for me to love the whole world. My only real problem is uh, my neighbor next door. So why is it easier to profess love and care in general than to practice it specifically? What kind of problems develop when we don't get along uh, with others? And what conditions in our society today contribute to the failure of being a good neighbor? Now let's look at the first uh, few verses here that we've read, verses 25 through 28 in chapter 10, and a question about eternal life. Now let's consider the background of these verses that we read, we now we're, that we've read studying this week. Jesus had sent 70 disciples out into the surrounding villages and towns that he had planned to visit. These disciples had just returned and were listening to Jesus teach. Now in verse 20, uh, he told them to rejoice because their names were written in heaven. Now in saying that their names were written down signified that they were indeed saved. Now as we come to verse 25, we find that a lawyer was nearby and listening to Jesus. He stood and asked Jesus how he too might uh, inherit eternal life. Typically, lawyers were members of the class of professional experts on the Mosaic law. In other parts of scripture, this lawyer would be called a scribe. It could be that Luke preferred the term lawyer because he was writing mainly to the Gentiles. Lawyers were responsible for copying and preserving the Old Testament. They had unique knowledge of the Old Testament, and this helped them develop as experts and interpreters of the law. Many times the lawyers' opinions 
on the scriptures were widely accepted as the correct interpretations. Now, Luke is very pointed in indicating that the purpose behind the lawyer's question was to tempt Jesus, thus putting him to the test. His question concerned receiving eternal life. And in a way, this question is asked by every generation. So it certainly is not an unusual question. Now, being a knowledgeable lawyer, he had considerable training on the subject of the Old Testament. Most likely, the lawyer was attempting to put Jesus on the spot, or even possibly embarrassing him. But it could also be that the lawyer, upon hearing much of Jesus' teachings, there was a note of sincerity in his question. Jesus did not answer the lawyer directly, but asked a counter question. He pointed to the lawyer to uh, he, excuse me, he pointed the lawyer to the Old Testament, and by doing this, Jesus was establishing a basis for his answer about eternal life from the area of the lawyer's experience and or expertise. The answer to the lawyer's question could be found in information that he already knew. The lawyer responded to Jesus' question by quoting from Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6, verse 5, and Leviticus chapter 19, verse uh, 18. Jesus later used these same verses as a synopsis of the entire Old Testament. And if you look in Matthew 22, verses uh, 37 through 40, it tells us, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is likened to it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, and on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Now, the Greek word for the type of love demanded is agape. The very nature of God defines the word love. Paul summarized God's nature in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verses 1 through 13, and many of us know that as the love chapter. Now, God's love is a totally selfless love. It is a love that is completely focused on the one loved. The response of the one loved does not affect the quality or the quantity of this love. One's unqualified love for God and for one's neighbor sums up the essence of the Old Testament law. We should know that knowing the right Bible verse is not the same as applying that particular verse to one's life. The lawyer knew what the law said, but he had not implemented its truth in his own life, and even his own daily life, if you will. The lawyer stepped up and attempted to test Jesus, but Jesus turned the situation around and was actually testing the lawyer. Do you think the lawyer passed his test? Let's go on to verse 29. Another question from the lawyer. Who is my neighbor? One writer tells us the basic meaning of the Greek word that is translated justify here in verse 29 means to behave according to one's own station within society. Basically, the man was attempting to demonstrate that his behavior always complied to the standards demanded of his position. He most likely was also trying to prove that he had indeed obeyed God's commandment to love his neighbor. The lawyer may have believed that Jesus uh, wouldn't actually answer his question, thereby stumping him and validating his own personal feeling of superiority when he compared himself to Jesus. No matter what his motiv uh, motivations uh, might have been in asking this question, he limited whom he considered to be his neighbor. In actuality, the leaders of Judaism in Jesus' day debated the identity of one's neighbor. Most concluded that only another Jew could qualify as one's neighbor. The general consensus was that Gentiles and Samaritans were beneath all Jews. Racism and hatred is certainly not a new phenomenon today. It's always 
been with us since sin entered the world. And even still, many eliminated all obvious sinners, such as tax collectors. In other words, uh, Jews did not consider tax collectors a neighbor uh, at all. The question would further open another door for Jesus to teach truth. And then in verse uh, 30, uh, we're beginning, we'll be looking at the parable Jesus gives. In verse uh, 30, we're talking about the traveler, a traveler in need. Jesus would tell this parable that would go directly to the heart of the true ethical meaning of neighbor. Jesus would illustrate who was a neighbor and how to love a neighbor. The first character in Jesus' parable was a traveler going to Jerusalem towards Jericho. And Jericho is only about 20 miles east of Jerusalem. The road between the two would be a steep and winding, uh, and it was an ideal uh, road for robbers. All of the traveler's possessions were taken, including his clothing. He was beaten to the point of unconsciousness. The robbers may have assumed that he was dead, but either way, he was certainly someone in need of help. Now, if you would take uh, time to look around uh, as we travel this world, we will become aware that we are surrounded by people who have all kinds of needs. Many times these needs may be less obvious than those of Jesus' victim in the parable, but they are no less real. Let's look at the two examples of failing to be a neighbor in verses 31 and 32. Now, as we look at these next two characters in Jesus' parables, both were supposedly uh, vocationally servants of God. The first was a priest. The second was a Levite. Upon approaching the injured man, the priest was confronted with a decision to help his fellow human being, or he could cross the road and continue his journey without contacting the body. There, of course, could be several reasons going through the priest's mind for not helping. Temple ritual was the priest's fundamental responsibility. He, like the other robbers, may have assumed that the man was dead. So, makes it easy. The man's dead. I can't do any good for him. I have to go to the temple, so I'll just keep going. Could be what was on his mind. Now, contact with a corpse would render the priest ceremonially unclean. Leviticus 15, verse 2. But many believe the priest was going in the direction away from Jerusalem, so he most likely had completed his duties for that day. Helping the man would not have interfered with his immediate obligations, but the uh, the uncleanness uh, might prevent his participation in future rites. Since the man was naked, the priest could not have distinguished his racial or occupational background. Most likely, the clothing of the day would determine if somebody was a Gentile or if somebody was a tax collector and so forth. But if the priest could determine if the man was a tax collector or a Gentile, a sinner, he would, in his own mind, have no obligation to help him in the first place because of the norms of the day. The priest decided the risks were too great, and he hurried around the motionless body at a safe distance. Now, the Levite was also traveling on the same road from Jerusalem to Jericho. He, too, could not have missed the body lying there on the side of the road. The Levite, like the priest, had ritual duties and most likely reached similar conclusions as did the priest. Neither of these two considered the individual lying on the roadside as one who was created in the image of God and now had serious needs. They saw him as a source of a possible social embarrassment or religious defilement or a total inconvenience to their plans and to their schedule. Their decision not to help the man was in fact a failure to serve God faithfully. 
Now let's look at verses 33 through 35, and this is a demonstration of love for someone, a neighbor in need. Now this final character in Jesus' parable was the Samaritan. The hatred between the two groups, Samaritans and Jews, made interaction all, all but impossible. For the lawyer to whom Jesus was speaking, the, the idea of a Samaritan being a neighbor would have been a traumatic shock. Jesus painted a great contrast. And some Bible students believe the Samaritan may have been traveling in the opposite direction than what the priest and the Levite had been traveling. If this is the case, the Samaritan traveler would have to have crossed the road to give aid to the man who was hurt. In other words, he made a greater effort to help rather than to refuse to help. Regardless of the direction he actually was traveling, when the Samaritan saw the injured man, he went directly to him to offer help. If one is to help, it requires getting involved. He used what he had to treat the wounds. He used wine, oil, bandages. All of these items would be beneficial to healing injuries. Oil and wine together would indicate a comprehensive treatment of the man's wounds. The wine would kill the bacteria immediately and the olive oil would prevent its return. Now the Samaritan then transported the man to the closest inn. The injuries were such uh, that it required the man to remain several days at the inn in order to recover. The Samaritan gave the innkeeper two denarii to cover expenses until he could return. Going even further, the Samaritan ensured the innkeeper that he would cover any additional expenses that he might incur above uh, what he had already given him. This Samaritan seemed to have complied totally with God's charge to love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, if we take genuine interest in others, it will cause us to act in an appropriate way to meet their needs. An appropriate response to help someone is not some token gesture, but a comprehensive response to the issue or to the problem. These days, time and inconvenience prevents many from helping someone in need. But still, that is no excuse for the believer not to provide help to someone in need. Now let's look at the command of Jesus in verses 36 to 37. When Jesus concluded his parable, he asked the lawyer, lawyer who acted like a neighbor, the priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan? The question redirected the lawyer's focus from who is my neighbor to how can I act as a neighbor? The lawyer responded logically and truthfully. The Samaritan had shown compassion and acted to meet the, rob uh, the robbery victim's needs. Therefore, he was the true neighbor. So the lawyer, if he received eternal life, had to duplicate that attitude and behavior of the Samaritan. The lawyer, though understanding Jesus' conception of a neighbor, is inadequate if he didn't apply this truth to his life. And the same for us. We many times understand the scripture when we are studying and reading them, but unless we apply these truths to our daily lives, what good is it? Jesus commanded the lawyer to apply the truth of loving one's neighbor to his life. Do you have boundaries? that you will not cross in order to help someone in need? How did the lawyer define neighbor? What have you learned from Jesus when it comes to relating to people? There are many today that will try to distinguish between religious, religious rather, and secular. Making such, such distinctions in the life of the Christian, they're not biblical. 1 John 4.20 tells us, If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. In James chapter 2, we are told, If people are hungry, feed them. 
If others are naked, clothe them. God demonstrated his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We are to demonstrate love toward those we encounter that are in need of help. Maybe a good question to ask is why do you suppose Jesus chose the Samaritan to be the hero of his parable? Think about that question. Well, I hope this lesson has been helpful to you. I hope it's been challenging to you. I encourage you to go back and read over the scriptures again and meditate upon them and pray uh, to God for uh, direction as you relate to the folks you encounter in your daily life. My prayer for you and for me is that we open our eyes where we are and recognize those that may uh, be in need and let us reach out in God's love to help. May our hearts be filled with love for God and for the people around us. And may you continue to experience the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ today and the days ahead.